I've been looking at the moon since I was a kid. I got my first telescope when I was, I think, 11 or 12. The first thing I ever pointed it at was the moon because the, I just couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to go out and look at it. And when I saw it through the lens for the first time, it was breathtaking because you can, the moon's a world. You can, it's actually close enough that you can look at it through a telescope and see landscapes. You can see a terrain. You can see surface features. Can't do that with the planets very well. And it's really quite startling when you first turn it on the moon and you realize that that's up there in the sky hovering over us, almost close enough to touch. I didn't really know that I wanted to study it scientifically until actually I was an, almost an adult. I was already in school. I was studying engineering, electrical engineering. And, uh, but I followed the Apollo missions religiously. And my personal favorite Apollo mission was Apollo 15, which flew to the moon in July of 1971. And I watched these two guys, Dave Scott and Jim Irwin, explore the moon. And that might fill a square for the football size rock. And they were so enthusiastic and so good at it and sure so much fun to watch that it got me interested in geology. It got me excited about actually going to the moon, not just to visit it, not just to put my footprint down there, but to go and understand it, to collect its rocks, to understand its history, to recover a lost chapter of, uh, a, of, a, of a previous existence. And that's why I got interested in the moon. That's the first time I really got excited about doing lunar science. Well, the moon's scientifically valuable because it retains a record of what happened very early in the history of the solar system. Uh, the Earth is a very dynamic planet. Uh, volcanoes erupt, the wind blows, water erodes the land landscape, and the surface changes. It changes very rapidly. Now, not rapidly in human terms, but rapidly in geological terms. But the moon is an ancient world. The moon preserves the way things were three, four billion years ago. So when we look at the moon, we're looking at a missing chapter of the history of all the planets, a time when giant asteroids collided and threw up tons of material into space, when volcanic lavas resurfaced uh, the planet, when things deformed and buckled under the weight of accumulating piles of lava. All those things happened to the moon. They happened very early in the history of the moon. And by understanding that, we understand the early history of all the planets. That history is something we only partly understand right now. It's telling us in broad outline what's happened, but we don't know in detail what, what actually happened in that part of uh, the solar system history. When I look up at the sky and look at the moon today, and, I, and I've studied it now for 50 years almost, and it's, it's still a very familiar place to me. I think I know the landscape of the moon almost as well as I know the landscape of the Earth. Even though it's familiar to me, I still wonder about the things that we don't know about it. I'm sure there's some very big surprises awaiting us there. Uh, just as one example, we recently found that there's water at the poles of the moon. Now that was something that was not only unexpected, but the degree to which the different data sets indicate that it's there is totally unexpected. The main reason I'm excited about it is because for the first time we're going to be able to use extraterrestrial materials in a practical application. The water on the moon not only supports human life, you can drink the water, you can separate it into its component gases and breathe the oxygen, you can use hydrogen and oxygen as a medium of energy storage. Uh, you can use electricity to, to separate water into the component gases during the daytime, the electricity generated from solar panels, and then at night when there is no solar illumination, you can combine that hydrogen and oxygen in fuel cells to generate electricity. So it's a medium of energy storage. But the most important usage of it is as rocket propellant. Liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen are the most powerful chemical propellants we know of. And there is enough water at the poles of the moon I calculated for the North Pole, just in the areas where we see ice in the, in, from the radar data, this is nearly pure ice, there's about 600 million metric tons. That's enough to launch the equivalent of a space shuttle every day from the surface of the moon for 2,200 years. And what that means is that we can use the moon as a logistics depot and create a permanent space transportation infrastructure with the moon as our first railhead in space. I look upon the moon as an enabling asset. It's not just a destination, it's a place where we can go and actually learn 
how to live off the land in space.